I shared some scripture last week. I'll start there again. This was all for free. Uh, this doesn't count on my time, by the way. <laughs> but basically, uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, the word love doesn't actually show up here. But it says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. No, God's not hiding from you until you get holier than thou, until you've uh, become so holy. Holy means separated unto God. And for most people, most religious mindsets, holy means somebody that lives completely by the uh, Word of God, every I dotted, every T crossed, but that's not really the case. I mean, certainly our pattern of life will change uh, to accommodate the principles of God's Word, but you don't have to make yourself holy in order to, you know, see the Lord. The Lord's not withholding Himself from you. He just lives on a plane or in a place that you have to go in order to sense Him. I mean, some people have open visions and see Him. Talk to Jesus. I've never had one of those. Uh, I'm married to someone who has. Ticks me off because I'm the pastor. <laughs> but I've never had that kind of encounter with the Lord. I've certainly sensed His presence in ways that uh, have been... Uh, <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's hard to even comment on them. I've gotten caught up. I have not ever seen the Lord in the way that a lot of people have. Moses wanted to see it. The Lord showed Moses his hinder parts, you know, because he couldn't, he couldn't survive a complete revelation of God. Uh, the, you know, the intensity of that would have been more than flesh could have stood. But God's not hiding himself from you. He wants you to know him to experience Him, to see Him, whether it's with the eye of faith, the eye of your spirit, your heart, or whether it is an open vision, He wants you to be convinced of His reality and His love for you. So He's not going to withhold Himself from you. But He said, if you don't give yourself over to love, then you're not in the same room He's in. You're trying to sense the Lord somewhere He is not because He only operates occupies a room called love. Amen. And when we read this verse, follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, we think, well, what's this got to do with the love of God? That's what holiness is. Holi holiness isn't separation unto a set of laws that you've got to obey in order to be a Christian that's worthy to see the Lord. God defines love as himself. He is the person of love. The Bible says over and over again, God is love. And so holiness is separation unto a life of love. Holiness is separation unto living by the law of love, the royal law of love, putting other people before yourself. And then you can experience peace with all men. You'll never experience peace with all men without learning how to live by the law of love. Uh, the peace is actually defined as absence of conflict. That's the most basic definition of all, and it's obvious. Peace is the absence of conflict. It goes a step further when you're talking about with the brethren, with people that are saved. It says that we should be one heart, one mind, striving together with them for the faith of the gospel. It comes into a, a place of concord and harmony with people whose belief systems are grounded in the same principles that yours are, which is the Word of God. But for most people out there, they don't know the Word like you do. They're not grounded with you. And so the larger definition of peace, absence of conflict, becomes important. And so you'll never experience the absence of conflict with men until you're separated to God, who is the personification of love. You are separated unto a life based on the love of God. 
and living by that royal law of love. And so we see that these provide a context of understanding. You want to know how to live in love? Uh, or if you are uh, living by that law, then is there an absence of conflict in your life or not? Because the presence of conflict means that there's some place in that particular relationship or other relationships that you're not, you're not loving properly. You're not living by that royal law or the conflict wouldn't be there. And therefore, you're not holy. You're not separated into a life of love. And so then the next verse becomes real relevant to you if that's the case. It says, look diligently to this. To what? To being separated unto a life of love. Look diligently lest any man, first of all, fail of the grace of God. The grace of God is the power of God to do things you can't do and to have things you shouldn't have because you can't earn them. Salvation is an example of that. It's a, it's a free gift of God, but we receive it by faith, right? Healing is a grace of God. You receive it by faith, right? Supernatural provision of God, Jehovah Jireh, that happens to you as a grace of God. But every grace, every, um, every part of your life that God's grace is going to be manifest, His unmerited favor, His supernatural provision, in whatever arena of life it may be, that's what His grace is, has got to be received by faith. You receive, beginning with salvation, you receive it by faith. You can't logically understand how some guy dying on the cross, and even if he was raised from the dead, and there's a lot of controversy about that in the body of Christ, which, well, that's not the body of Christ. You've got to believe in the resurrection or you're practicing something else. Uh, but, you know, it is still a fact that these particular graces beginning with salvation have to be received by faith. You have to decide you're going to believe and then do what's necessary to cultivate faith. Faith comes by hearing. It's a principle that you continue to hear as you read the Word of God or read books or listen to tapes and you continue to reinforce by what you hear the things that you've decided to believe from the Bible. You realize your belief system. I don't know why I'm going here because this isn't my sermon today. But you do realize that your belief system, whatever it is right now, comes from the things you've heard the most of. Since you were born into this earth and were able to distinguish uh, human language as a little baby, then your belief system is being shaped even at that very moment by what your parents say to you, how they relate to you. If they tell you that you're just a loser and you'll never be a success, Unfortunately, that's true for a lot of kids. Uh, they weren't really wanted when they were born, and they hear a lot of trash growing up like that. But the sad part about it is that's what they believe because that's all they've ever heard. That I'm, you know, or if they're told since they're a little baby that the color of their skin is wrong, they're going to be persecuted, and they're going to be, uh, you know, there's going to be racial bias and prejudice against them all the days of their life. Don't be telling your kids that. Because they'll believe it, and that's what will draw it to them. We are all equal in the body of Christ. There is no male, no female, no Jew, Gentile, no bond, no free. You should be preaching that to your kids. Because if they think, because of what you've said in front of them or to them all their life, that they're going to they're gonna have a lifetime of persecution, that's what they will get. Well, so see, this is all stuff that, uh, you know, I was going to be real disciplined this service and finish right on time. But you're, you're looking like you're going to be here until 1 or 1.30. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. But basically, so, you know, 
when you read these verses, follow peace with all men in holiness, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. I mean, you need to be serious about these things or you will fail of the grace of God, meaning, not meaning that God's going to withdraw His grace from you. It's been extended to everyone ever born in this world and it's still there. But you have to receive it, and you receive it by faith, and faith only works by love. So if you're not separating your life unto holiness, you can't even believe for the grace of God to be manifest. If you have an indices Bible, you'll see a, a number by uh, fail, and the center reference column tells you what it really says, which is fall from. God isn't removing His grace from you. you uh, you're falling from it when you refuse to base your life on the law of love because that's the, that's the only way you can know God, which is what C is a reference to, know Him in a personal way, is to occupy the same room He does, and that's a room called love. It's the only way His grace can manifest itself in your life because you can't believe for that grace except by love, realizing that the Lord, you know, is blessing you, enabling you, empowering you. Amen. Not so you can have enough money to retire early. I already said that. Not so you can get healed and be a fat, happy couch potato. You're the body of Christ. You're His hands. You're His feet. You're His mouthpiece. When you are healed and whole, you're going to be a lot more effective in the kingdom of God. So it's not just about you getting over your pain or discomfort of whatever infirmity you're dealing with, just so you can be comfortable. Now, God wants that for you. He loves you. Redemption includes healing. But you need to understand your effectiveness in the kingdom of God and being an influence to expand that kingdom is going to be enhanced by your testimony of good health or healing. Yeah. Yeah. So at any rate, it says that if you don't look diligently toward living a life of love, then you will fall from the grace of God. And it says, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Bitterness I described as one of the most deadly forms of spiritual cancer you can have. It's real easy to be bitter. A lot of people like to focus on how they have been wronged in the course of their life. And the more they consider how badly they've been wronged, the more bitter they become. Bitterness is rooted in an animosity, even hatred. We know as Christians we're not supposed to hate anybody, but a little animosity seems to sneak under the door a lot of times. You just don't like somebody because they have crossed your wires up. They don't believe like you do. They have perhaps treated you poorly or, or something. And so this little root of bitterness begins to arise in you. Bitterness is the fruit of something else that's called a root. It says, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Bitterness is the fruit that a deeper root will produce. And that deeper root is unforgiveness. When somebody has wronged you so badly that you haven't been able to forgive them, then that root of unforgiveness will produce this bile called bitterness. It erodes the soul. It robs you of your peace and your joy and any chance at happiness. Every time you think of that incident or that person, that bile begins to rise inside of you. It's almost a physical thing. And it destroys the quality of life that you are to have in Christ. And it begins with unforgiveness.
Church isn't just Sunday service. Here's some of the ministries that make our church a community. Our youth ministry provides a powerful and engaging worship experience for students grades six through 12 with strong biblical teaching and a great sense of community. I love kids ministry because we have so much fun while also knowing that the word of God is getting planted in their hearts. Compass ministry is important because without a special needs ministry, some families are unable to attend church in person. Life groups provides an opportunity for people to make connections and grow spiritually. The goal of Caring Counseling is to be a resource to our members through the many stages in life. Our desire is to bring in hope and restoration through Jesus Christ. Living free is unique because it takes the power of God's love mixed with powerful recovery principles and brings long lasting sobriety to hurting people. Maranatha is our pre-K through 12th grade Christian school that provides your children a nationally recognized college preparatory education right here at our Brooklyn Park campus. There's so many things I love about our Northwest campus, but it's truly the presence of God from the worship to the message to the community that's been cultivated. It's home to me and so many others in the Rogers area. La Iglesia Española es un lugar para toda la familia donde podrás disfrutar una experiencia y conocer a Dios más íntimamente. Outreach is literally reaching out beyond the four walls of the church, whether that be here in our community locally by helping elementary schools with backpacks, helping families have Thanksgiving meals through baskets of blessing, helping children get toys for Christmas through Share Christmas, or helping our medical community by providing meals for them. There's so many ways that we help our community, but we also reach out internationally and we help other countries and orphanages and ministries. This year, we're gonna have something every month featuring different outreaches, and we're just so excited to bring practical help to people while bringing them also the love of Jesus. From all of us at Living Word, thank you for being a part of this ministry. The first thing that love gives is forgiveness. It is the first thing that we are to give somebody is forgiveness. You can't give them anything else until you give them forgiveness. This is the first thing God gave us when God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son who was to be the instrument of redemption or forgiveness of our sin of our misdeeds, to open the door to his forgiveness of us. The first thing that love does is give forgiveness. Say amen to that. Amen. I've had so many people over the years of my ministry, 42 now I guess it is, 43, so many people say to me, you don't know what they did to me, Pastor, I can't forgive them. And there have indeed been some horrible tales of abuse as children. And I mean just horrible things. But you have to forgive them. Not for their sake, but for your sake. Because it'll spring up into such bitterness and bile within you that you'll barely be able to function as you get older. It gets worse as you get older. These things, these, these points of unforgiveness in your life will produce such terrible bitterness. It's like, and very often it's with people that you're supposed to be close to. Very often this is family members. Very often this is people that you know so well, you know their faults and the, and the things they've done wrong better than they do probably. And so this is where the enemy comes to you. When a marriage begins to go south, it's always about offense of one party to the other. You know, maybe the guy was unfaithful, ran out. Well, if that marriage is to ever stand a chance, the wife's going to have to forgive that. Now, forgiveness and trust are two different things. Trust has to be earned. It takes ignorance to invest trust in someone that has demonstrated they can't be trusted in a certain area. But forgiveness is different than trust. It's a release of the responsibility for their action because you know we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, rulers of darkness, and high places. They got influenced 
by the wrong spirit. And the warfare they're under is something you might have a hard time even imagining. You need to forgive them so you can move on in your life in a more effective, in a more effective way. So, oh, wow. I've gotten so far off track, I'm going to have to figure out how to get back on. Well, let me say this then. So we, got, we have to deal with the, ten, uh, the tendency that our carnal nature has to hold on to things that people have done to us and to allow that root of unforgiveness to produce bitterness which is going to run your life. It'll only grow until you get rid of it. You can't mow it off at the top. You don't get rid of crabgrass by mowing it, cutting off the obvious fruit. You can go to church and rejoice in the Lord and get happy one Sunday afternoon for a little while, but if you don't dig out the root, that stuff is going to come back again. And the root of bitterness is unforgiveness. So, and this is the first thing that love gives. So understand this as being an important context of our understanding. Love gives forgiveness before it, before it can do anything else. That's where it begins. So let's talk about how conflict is generated. This all started with a relationship. Uh, we weren't following after peace. Conflict breaks out, uh, meaning conflict, perceived conflicts of interest, viewpoints, differences, whatever, and we keep hammering away at it until it becomes a real issue in our heart. Uh, it becomes an issue of forgiveness uh, first, and then the bitterness will begin to, will begin to show up. So if we can eliminate the conflict, and love will do that, how does that, how do we gain a, again, a contextual understanding of how uh, we can eliminate conflict, how we can eliminate uh, these confrontations with people, these little minor wars and the bitterness that begins to be stirred. How can we deal with that? There's one word that you have to really come to appreciate, and that is offense. You have to become someone who does not deal in offense, either in giving it by being offensive or offending someone else or receiving it. Not allowing yourself to become offended even when they have done you wrong. The word offend means to threaten. Somebody becomes defensive when they feel threatened. And there are many different levels that people are threatened on. You can feel a physical threat, and fear will, fear will begin to rise and become a part of the equation. But there are many other forms that a threat can take. You can threaten somebody's self-image. You can threaten a person's self-esteem, the way they see themselves. You can threaten somebody's financial security. If you happen to be a boss and you're not smart enough uh, to communicate in a way consistent of the word and you tell them, hey, you don't get this right, you're going to get fired. So there's a threat to their financial solvency and their welfare that comes uh, through that kind of communication. If we can learn to conduct our relationships without offense being part of them, we have eliminated the majority, the vast majority of the conflict uh, that would otherwise have arisen. And if we eliminate the conflict, we eliminate the, uh, the root of unforgiveness and the bitterness that it produces because they don't need to be forgiven if they can avoid offense, if they can avoid threatening somebody else's welfare without even knowing it. 
I did a series on leadership years ago that talked about a study uh, that a couple of guys back in the 70s, Heilman, Heilman and Horstein, I still remember their names, had made, and they wrote a book called Managing Human Resource in Organizations. And their big revelation, they didn't know it was a Bible principle, they stumbled on it by mistake, but their, their big revelation was to eliminate the threat environment. In the corporate workplace, el eliminate the threat environment. As a manager, as a leader, as an owner, an entrepreneur, whatever, you've got to be able to communicate with people under your authority in a way that doesn't call, cause them to feel threatened in some way. And being aware of the possible threats is an important part of learning to lead people effectively. You can't force somebody to follow your lead. They got to want to follow your lead. Well, see, I'm getting off on another rabbit trail here that I'll try to avoid. But essentially, uh, when you offend somebody, you are threatening them on some level. It might be a threat to their ego or their pride, which they're not, they're not supposed to be operating in anyway, but it's still a threat. And it will produce the kind of response you don't want in that relationship. Because their walls will go up, they'll become defensive, they won't be open to a lot of what you have to say because they, they don't want that. I mean, you, you stepped across a, a line with them already. So learning not to offend becomes important. It's, and it has to do with two different directions. You're being offensive to somebody or you're being offended by somebody. A lot of people know that in order to strengthen your relationship with God, it is good to read the Bible. Yet not many people know what to read in the Bible. And that's why we created our daily Bible reading plan. Sign up today on our website to receive this daily email. Thanks for watching. Join us again next week. And until then, remember, God wants you to be a winner in every area of life.